You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, welcome to another super friendly episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. Super friendly indeed, and my name is Rob, and you're listening to episode 754. Thank you, as always, for hanging out with us today. Definitely appreciate it. We definitely do appreciate it. We also appreciate those reviews that you have been uh, putting in. We really, really do thank you for that. Uh, If you want to get these shows uh, autonomously on your phone, all you have to do is subscribe uh, on iTunes, Overcast, or wherever you download episodes. Um, but we're actually also want to say a special thank you to a couple of the guys who recently wrote us a review on Amazon for the book that we wrote, Live in the Drone Life, which talks all about how to build a safe, successful business flying drones, how uh, I did it, and how you can do it as well. If you want to pick that up, just go to DroneUbook.com, give it a quick read. The audiobook is also available on Audible. Dot com or wherever you download your audio books like iTunes. Indeed. So, Check it out. Um, but anyway, uh, very excited. We're going to be recording a couple of shows here as it is going to be a very busy travel weeks coming up. So I just want to give you a heads up. The FAA UAS Symposium is coming up here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and in all honesty, I wish the FAA would actually run their own conferences. I love you guys, but, but really, uh, we need something better. It took Hmm. the team over at AUVSI about two weeks to get back on our our press pass, and someone else had to reach out directly to the director of the FAA to get theirs. It ended up costing us over $400 on a flight because of his uh, inability to approve a form on Formstack. If you young millennials are familiar with that WordPress plugin, which is rather easy to access. I don't know. Could take maybe 35 seconds. Hmm. That was if I was having a bad day with a broken mouse and a computer with a <laughs> internet connection of maybe hotel speed, maybe five meg down and up. Yeah, who knows? Maybe they're overloaded over there like everybody else is. Maybe he's 22 years too old to do the job. I don't know. <laughs> Just an idea. All right, anyway, on a happy note, though, they're going to be talking about BVLOS operations. They're going to be talking about uh, remote ID and the potential necessity and regulations that they're going to be building in. Uh, They're also going to be talking about how to get complex waivers. So we've got a lot of reporting that's going to be coming to you from kind of from Baltimore, as well as some other locations as well. Um, We're really excited about things that are coming up here. And uh, just a heads up, uh, if you are interested, we are doing a webinar uh, March 19th. If you are signed up on the DroneU list, uh, just go to the DroneU.com or DroneU.education. And you can actually uh, type your email in for the newsletter and you'll get notifications for the webinars coming up. And one of these webinars coming up is how most drone applications cannot give you what you want if you're trying to create 3D models. So we're going to talk about drone deploy and how you can really only do 2D with them. We're going to talk about Pix4D. We're going to be talking about uh, Maps Made Easy. We're going to be talking about a lot of the different applications that you can use for uh, drone mapping. And the thing is, you know, with drone mapping, especially with 3D modeling of these maps, there are so many things that you really have to do in order to make uh, the models look good. And frankly, there's only one app out there Mm-hmm. that really works to automate the whole process. And we're going to be talking about that. Um, but uh, that webinar is the 19th. And then I'm doing a webinar on the 26th of March on sales. Now, sales are something that, um, as John, our team member on the flight crew here at Drone you said yesterday, I'm not a natural-born salesman like you. Hmm. It's not a natural-born skill. It's a natural-born skill to be personable and happy and smile at everything like a golden retriever does. Uh, <laughs> that's what you can just call me. Uh, anyway, well, I'm going to be talking about the key to sales, about closing sales. I'm going to talk about some of the rules of sales. Um, and I think it could really help a lot of people uh, just kind of get more business and understand the sales process, mm-hmm. um, understand the confidence needed. Uh, and yeah, you know. Maybe even do a little role play. Maybe call somebody like you've done before. That'd be cool. 
I have done that before. I mean, I'm not promising anything. And most but who knows? We'll people, see how it goes. Most of those people that I did that to did not know that they were on a webinar. Like, I just made a straight cold call. Right. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I well, don't know. And I'll just say, we get a lot of questions from people that are saying, you know, I've been at this for a while and I feel like I've beaten the streets and doing all the right things and I've got my cards and I've got my brochures and I'm just kind of making stuff up here. But you get the point. They're doing things and they're not quite seeing the success that they'd like to see. And so I think this webinar will give people some pointers that they can try beyond some of those normal, if you will, things. That... Yeah. I will say, you know, business is all about relationships. And if you don't go about building relationships the right way, uh, you're not going to build relationships for success. Absolutely. So, Absolutely right. Um, anyway, but let's go ahead. Let's get into today's question, uh, which is brought to you by our friends at Go Professional Cases. Check out their cases. Um, I personally use them. I've got the Phantom backpack. It's probably my favorite backpack right now. They may still be backordered on it, but if you're looking for a discount, just check it out. Go to goprofessionalcases.com. Make sure that that is correct. Goprofessionalcases.com. And use discount code DRONEU15 to save on a case that you can use to fly your drone to protect it. Whether you like the backpacks or the hard cases, I've heard some different people say that they like different mm -hmm. equipment. I personally love the backpacks. Uh, in fact, I just recently used the Phantom backpack on the airplane to carry not only my Phantom batteries, but my Inspire batteries as well. Yep. And it worked out really, really well. So cool. anyway, check them out. GoProfessionalCases.com. Also, you've got to check out Living the Drone Life. If you haven't picked up a copy, just go to DroneUbook.com and pick up your copy today. Anyway, that is going to do it for our little ads. Let's hear the question. Hello, Robin Paul. This is your friend Pavlos from Greece. My question to you guys is, if I use a zoom lens, such as the Panasonic Lumix 1442 on my Inspire One with the X5 camera, will Pix4D or another mapping software be able to deal with the different focal lengths? Is such information included in the image metadata? Um, I'd like to tell you that I've made a similar question to Pix4D, but I really trust your opinion on this, and I hope to hear from you soon. Love the mapping-related uh, episodes, and I'm really frustrated that I missed the live webinar as it was past midnight here in Greece. Keep it up, guys. Bye. Mm. Thanks, Pavlos, for the question. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, maybe you can catch the next webinar coming up that'll... Cover some of the same stuff, but um, maybe even go a little bit deeper. But. Yeah, there's. Uh, we're going to cover actually some different things here. We're going to be covering really more about acquisition strategy. Um, it seems like a lot of people are, are coming to our in-person classes because, and they say, I'm not saying this, they say that we are one of the only people that actually talks about the five separate acquisition strategies of mapping. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess other people aren't teaching on that. So. Which is fascinating because the acquiring of the data is going to ultimately result in the best models, right? Yes, that is true. The better data that you accumulate. Like, look at this beauty. Yeah. Purdy. Are we going to show people that? We could show people that. Here, I'll just give you the link. Maybe you can give put a little it in the link show. to that. Boom. I got to make it public now, though. All right publicize it. So he's asking a question about mapping. Um, and, you know, in Pix4D online, they do talk about how to use Zoom in your maps. And there's a couple of caveats that are really, really important uh, for you. First of all, that 14 and 42 lens, uh, it's one of my favorites. I love that lens on the camera. You just have to make sure that you're setting up your camera properly uh, so that you don't have focus issues. I know a lot of people have been running into focus issues with the X5S. I even told a student at the Georgia training, I was like, you know, I really would not recommend mapping with the X5S or the X5R. Uh, hmm. You're going to see a lot of focus issues today. And if you, you may notice it after it's too late, you may have to take off again and set your focus in go four and then fly out. Like there, there are just some, some different things that you're going to have to do in order to really make it work. And sure enough, he had a bunch of problems um, w with focus. That was a significant issue. But he also was not using a zoom lens. Hmm. So that's interesting. Now, in, in regards to the zoom, if you want to use zoom in a project, which this is something we ran into with the whole baseball models. If you want to use zoom in a project, you literally have to use that level of zoom for every single shot that you take of that property. You cannot change the zoom. You're not, you, you cannot have like 
a variable zoom because then the software is not going to be able to accurately match those photos with other photos. And this is a problem that we've run into. They also talk about it in their corridor mapping section of the Pix4D um, information and labs online. So the, the information is there. You can use Zoom, but if you use Zoom, you have to use the same level of Zoom for each mission that you do. So if you do an orbit mission, you do a cross-hatching Nader mission, you've got to use that Zoom for every single picture that you take. So sure, you can use Zoom, but just be prepared to set the Zoom and forget it, which I know is kind of difficult on the 14 to 42. Um, so maybe use one of the extremes, like maybe set it all the way to, to 42 millimeters. Um, and, and I do want to say, I saw on Facebook the other day that someone posted that I need a good lesson in sensors um, because he was like, I, I guess I was talking about the 50 millimeter on the X7, which is a super 35. I realize it's not a full frame sensor, uh, but I'm also not going to take the time here to do the calculations on a 50 millimeter sensor on a crop frame is going to equal some obviously different amount of zoom. Um, I just mm. wanted to say that I understand that and I appreciate your um, criticism. Although I would just say if I were to sit here and do all these calculations all the time, the podcast would be really, really boring. <laughs> and I realize that focal length is, is actually um, different on a crop sensor. I get that. So cool. what I will do is pull up what it actually is on the X7 with the 50 millimeter. So as far as the zoom and the issue that you're saying you'd have if you don't set it to a particular zoom, is that difficult? What makes it difficult? Well, I just noticed when flying that lens that unless you literally set it to one of the extremes, um, you can literally accidentally touch um, mm. the control on the right side of your Go app, and it can change the zoom instantly. And if it just changes a little bit, then you're going to be significantly that significantly whole data set is compromised, screwed. basically. Yes, gotcha. That is true. Okay, that is so true. you got to be very careful. Yep, it is true. But you can use it. Mm -hmm. You totally can. So um, again, I would just say make sure once you pick your Zoom, you keep your Zoom. So I can't say that enough. But you wouldn't necessarily recommend somebody go buy this kind of a lens or camera for mapping. Is kind Definitely of what you're saying. the camera, no. The camera is a bad, bad, bad. Is there anything bad. about the Zoom lens that he's, that Pablos is referring to, or any Zoom lens for that matter that's high quality, that can actually be a benefit to your mapping jobs? Uh, yes, I definitely think so. I mean, you can get better detail in some aspects. Um, although, <laughs> here's the answer. Um, although uh, you will get better detail underneath awnings, um, structures, balconies, um, but you will get better detail overall. It'll take longer to process because you're going to have a lot more images, just FYI. Could you get better detail? Absolutely, it is possible. So by the way, um, the guy whose criticism on Facebook about my uh, knowledge of uh, focal length and sensors, the 50 millimeter um, lens on the X7 is actually a 75 millimeter equivalent, and the 16 millimeter is actually a 24 millimeter equivalent. So what I was trying to say on the last podcast too was that, um, or whichever show was, was that essentially when you use 4K 30 video, it is 24 millimeters on the 16, but when you go to 4K 60, it's cropped in even further. So it's more like a 36 millimeter lens. Just wanted to clarify. So there you have it. There's the actual math. There you go. And see how long it took and I was distracted and it's just not fun. Anyway. Podcast over. <laughs> anyway, um, if you have criticism though, I do appreciate it. You don't have to be all a uh, white horse about it. So... Um, anyway, uh, if you guys have uh, questions, comments, suggestions, um, or questions about uh, driving and talking on the phone, like a user <laughs> left us a message in the question bank, um, and I would say the answer to your question, sir, is that you don't have to look over the person next to you in the eye while you're having a conversation with them. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can just look forward and still talk to someone. It was the question about driving. It was stupid. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you, if you no, have... So we gave, we gave your answer. So maybe we should say the question really quick. The question simply was, since you gave an answer, why is it any different talking on a phone than it is talking to the person that's in the seat next to you when you're driving? And I think we all know the answer to that. But anyways, 
Yeah. First of all, <laughs> if you have your hand up to your head. Oh, yeah. There's all kinds of reasons. Okay, and anyway. so, yeah, we've, we've gone off the rails already. All right. Well, let's get out of here. Guys, thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. If you have a question, please don't leave us a comment on YouTube. There's so many YouTube comments. Please just ask the question on Ask Drone You, and I would be happy to answer it for you. That is going to do it for us today, though. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You. Ask Drone You.